Thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's with mixed emotions that I'm here. It was a great drive, and, and it's a really friendly crowd, and I, I love I love the Southern New Jersey. Um, but it also, for me, immensely means that the fall has started, because this was the talk that I knew I had to give this talk, and then I had to give about 12 more in the next month and a half, and, and I, I had to get all this stuff done before I came to this meeting. Of course, half of it isn't done, so I'm a little bit of a panic mode. But it also means that what you guys are going to have is, is my, my this talk. And this talk is, is the second time I've given this talk. It's a little bit revised. Um, and so I'm hoping for some feedback on how it went afterwards. And so what I want to talk about is understanding how many decline losses and declines, and also put a little bit of a spin on it and talk about what we can do, of course, to describe them. And just get an idea of what people think. How many people in the audience think that over the last 50 years, honeybee colonies have increased internationally or decreased? So increased, raise your hand. How do we say decreased internationally? Well, in, in actual fact, the number of honeybee colonies has gone up quite dramatically over the last 50 years. And you can see um, in, in, in this graph, most of that gain has been in Asia, especially China, South America, Argentina. But this rate of increase has not kept pace with the number of plants that are planted in, or that depend on honeybees for pollination. And so even though the number of colonies has increased, it hasn't increased at the rate we need to pollinate um, apples and different plants that require pollination. And that becomes important because as, as, as less developed countries become developed, they move away from rice and start growing fruits and vegetables and nuts. And those are, of course, the plants that rely on honeybee pollination. But of course, as, as you all know, losses haven't been even. You can see that there are some countries like Spain, where there's been a huge increase in the number of colonies kept over the last 20 years. Notably, though, in the United States, we've seen a significant decrease, as well as some other countries. Germany actually is a very interesting case. Germany lost most of its colonies, and, all, and it lost half of its colonies when it actually reunited. But there was East and West Germany. Eastern Germany actually used honey in the bartering system in the informal market. And so as soon as, as the, the wall closed, all those people said, I'm not doing that anymore, and they abandoned these colonies, they saw a huge crash in the number of colonies in Germany just because the politics changed. So not all of this is because of disease um, and, other, and other factors. So this is a graph of the United States. These are the number of abandoned colonies in the United States. A couple of things that you can see here, of course, are that in, in during the Second World War was the most number of colonies ma managed in the states, about six million. And a lot of these colonies were managed because, of course, there was a sugar quota, and so honey was exempt from that, so it was used as an artificial sweetener. Huge demand for beeswax, actually, in order to waterproof the bombs and ammunition that were going overseas. And so there was a real demand for a lot of this stuff then. And you can see that there's been a steady decline now. Now we're at about two and a half million colonies in the country. Now, how many of you in the audience have trouble sleeping? That's not too bad. How many of you think that if I gave an hour presentation of grass like this, you'd fall asleep? <laughs> And so when I put this presentation together, I quickly realized that this was really putting me to sleep. And so I'm going to try something different. This is the second time I've tried it. We're going to play Beekeeper Feud. Now this is a little bit of a challenge because I've never watched Family Feud, but it's loosely based on that. But we're going to, what we're going to do is we, 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 we're going to have two, two, four, we're going to split the group in half. So this table is actually going to be split in half. And there's going to be this half of the room and this half of the room. And two people are going to be volunteered or volunteer from either side to come forward and represent your half of the room. And I think you've, you've helped select volunteer the people who are going to come. I'm about to choose the volunteers and Wendy. Yes, you're a volunteer. You're a volunteer. Anybody want to raise your hand? Because if you don't, I will for you. Yeah, no, you have two on either side. So just sort of even it out. <laughs> You're a volunteer. Please come on down. And finally. Oh, no, this side of the room. This side. We have two of those sides. Right down here. Yeah, we need two. 
So how it works is this. This group has the bell, and this group has the harmonica. And I'm going to put up a question, and the first team to either ring the bell or blow the harmonica, you want to get close to the harmonica, because the bell has the The first team to blow it can answer the question. Then you have to consult your group and see if they agree with you, and if they do, you can stick with your answer. And then this group can decide whether you agree or don't agree. If you get the question wrong, you get negative point. And if you got it right, you get a point. Or you get a point and no point if you guys got it wrong. Is that really clear? <laughs> Crystal clear? All right, are you guys ready? We're going to start simple. So it's divided down the middle? Yes. What percentage of our diet comes from red or just from honeybee? You have to wait for the question. <laughs> She can eat faster than you. Okay, so what's the answer? 80%? Do you agree? The group agree with her? No. No. Well, let me just sit with your answer. 70. Careful like your answer. I like your answer. Third, do you guys agree or disagree? We agree with the third. In fact, it is about 30, 35%. So, yeah, Nancy did a great job. Um, and I think this is a really important number for beekeepers to know. And, and to give that some graphical representation, if this was our, our breakfast, I'm sure you all had a really good breakfast that looked a lot like this. If you had no honeybees at all, this is what your breakfast would have looked like. Now, there's some give and take. For instance, you'll notice that the coffee cup is about 10% less because the coffee is 10% pollinated. Some of the salami should be removed because, of course, a lot of the meat that we eat is fed by alfalfa, and alfalfa is pollinated by honeybees to make the seeds. And so I think this is really important for all of us as beekeepers to know is this huge reliance on honeybees to make agriculture work. And that's why, in fact, if you look at this country, half of the colonies in this country are moved up and down the east and western coast and across the western state, or across the west to, to California, to pollinate crops. And so, for instance, it's not atypical for a beekeeper at the beginning of the year to be in Florida, move over to California almonds. And almonds is the big story here. 80% of the world's almonds are produced in California. It makes more money for the California economy than grapes and the wine industry does combined. So it's a huge crop. And they basically need every single colony they can get to pollinate that crop. This has huge implications for us because we're not islands. This means that if there's a new disease and, it, and it's contagious and it, it gets into one of these migratory operations that's going into California, every state in the country has that disease by the end of the year because they're all crunched up together and get spread out. Of course, a lot of colonies will go up to alfalfa for seed production or to canola for the hybrid seed production. Um, colonies go up to apples in Pennsylvania. A lot of colonies now are actually going from California to Maine to do low bush blueberries, um, cranberries in Massachusetts, pumpkins and cucumbers here in New Jersey. And so you can see that a lot of, of, a lot of the honey producing uh, colonies are in fact used for pollination. And that's the major source of income for most of colonies kept in the country. So I think we have sort of three quarters of a point for this team. <laughs> so, okay. Now one of the things I want to emphasize is, so before you ring your bell, is that there's a difference between declines, which is the loss over time. So over 60 years, we've had declines in this country. But losses are what happens every year. So we can have a lot of losses, but not declines. And that's because beekeepers, of course, are very good at replacing losses. If you have a dead colony, <laughs> you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> you're going to stand in the corner soon. Um, if you have a colony and it's died, and you have a live colony beside it, you can split that colony in half, add a queen, and you have two colonies again. So we're able to replace our losses really quickly. 
So we might not have a corresponding decline. So the next question is, what is thought to be the single most important driver of losses in the US? Well, the cause, yes. You guys aren't blowing your harmonica. Right? <laughs> it's not supposed to be in your pocket. It's supposed to be in your mouth. Starvation. Is there? I think we have to change this, this consultant. <laughs> so it's Baroa. Do you guys agree or disagree? That's a good question. I think it's Baroa. So you disagree? Or you agree? <laughs> Do you guys have a lot of problems? Your committee meetings might be really <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Here's the meeting process. So, for Robomites, of course, for Robomites, very good, before you get too excited, before you get too excited, for Robomites are, of course, really important parasites. These are big mites, of course. They, like, if we were bees, they'd be like dinner plates sucking our blood. Um, so really a problematic mite. However, if there's a growing evidence that the varroa mite in itself might not cause the damage that you think it does. It's in fact the viruses that are intimately involved in. If you think about it, these varroa mites have these really dirty mouth parts, and they're like a drug, like a drug user's needle. And so as you pass it along, you pass on these viruses. Some really interesting work just came out of Hawaii, where they were looking at viruses in the bee population before the, the varroa mite came, and you saw some of the viruses, they were all there, very low levels. When varroa mites came, not only did the viruses spread in that population really quickly, but the viruses themselves changed. And so as you know, every year we get cases of the flu. Well, it's not like every year the flu is exactly the same. You have more virulent strains of the flu. And it turns out that the varroa mite makes the viruses more virulent. And so this means that even though it might be the same virus, the virus itself has become much more problematic. It's become much more virulent to the bees. And so it's the varroa mite virus complex. So in fact, I'm going to give it to this team because they said disease. And you already said Varroa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the ones that said 80% pollination. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. You ready? Harmonica ready? All right. What is the single most important factor in the dramatic decline in honeybee colonies that occurred in the 1980s? End of question. The, the Varroa. You guys agree? <laughs> well, what do you think? What is the answer? When you read the bell, you have to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys say? <laughs> say, trade your mic. When you look at this graph, you can see that during the 1980s, there have been a lot of new parasites introduced. Tracheomite got introduced, spread, did a lot of damage. We now think Nosema serrana probably got introduced in the 1980s. There's some evidence for that. And then, of course, Varroa mite and its resulting complex. However, if you look at the slope of this graph before the 1980s and after the 1980s, it's exactly the same. The rate of loss or rate of decline is the same. And so in fact, it was Ronald Reagan that caused <laughs> And I say that because Ronald Reagan, in cutting the deficit, decided to stop counting colonies for the time he was pre the president. And when they started counting colonies again, they changed how they counted them. So they said, well, instead of counting all colonies, we're only going to count the colonies if you have five or more colonies. And so in fact, this drop is an artificial result of accounting as a result of changes in how we count the colonies. <laughs> so, uh, great, the, the great, the, the, that, that steady decline was in, that big drop you see in the 80s was probably not the result of any
certain biological factor. So, what is thought to be the most important driver of colony decline in the Earth? What's responsible for the steady decline we've seen since the 1940s? Wow, that was done with a lot of confidence. Cost of business, economics. Do you guys agree? I'll we'll stick with that answer. There was an overwhelming. How about you? Do you agree with the answer or disagree with the answer? Disagree. You disagree with the answer. So there's there actually are two two factors probably involved here. One is probably less important than the second. One is the change in landscape use. And we've seen dramatic changes in landscape use. And that was where before we used to have a lot of meadows. Now we're seeing with increased urbanization, we're seeing a lot of lawns. We're also seeing a lot of monoculture with corn. Other major honey producing regions are where there are dairy farms. And so it used to be 40 years ago, you would let your clover go into flour and then cut it, or your alfalfa go into flour and cut it. That's no longer the practice. Farmers try to cut their hay before, when the flower is still in bud, so it hasn't bloomed yet. That way there's more protein in the hay, which means all that, that clover and, and alfalfa fields aren't very valuable for bees anymore because they never let the flower. It's interesting in Pennsylvania, you always know Pennsylvania is going to have a really good honey flow when there's a drought year. And the reason is, is because alfalfa is really deep tap roots. And that means that, they, that there's not enough rain for them to take a second cut of hay, but that means the second flower is allowed to bloom in the alfalfa. And so you see a lot more honey production. So no doubt that some of this loss is the result of changing in landscape use. However, if this is a complicated graph, so forgive me for that. Here what we see is this is the number of change. This is a, a graph where we look at whether the next year, whether we had an increase in the number of colonies or whether we had a decrease in the number of colonies. And this is the price of honey. And basically what this graph shows you is that at $1.48, if the number of colonies or the price of honey is above $1.48, the number of colonies next year will go up. And if it's below $1.48, they'll go down. And this is a really hopeful sign, I think, because it means that beekeepers are able to overcome any of the challenges that are faced with them, provided they have the money to do so. I will say that this, this idea of honey being the guiding principle has probably changed in the last five years, and that's because of the almond pollination. Ten years ago, you were lucky if you got 65 bucks a hive in almond pollination in California. Now you get 165 bucks a hive. And what the beekeepers are saying is that they are spending more money than they've ever spent before keeping those colonies alive. In fact, they say that all the money they make on honey production all year round is totally consumed with keeping those colonies alive so they can bring them to California and they make any profit they're going to make. California almonds. And so some guys are spending $100 a high on treatments and treating and giving them protein and feeding them sugar syrup in order to keep those colonies viable for that pollination. So there's a real dramatic shift in how the large beekeepers are making their money. So the answer changes in landscape use and economics. So we'll give it to Justin. All right, next question. Oh no, it's not a question, it's an advertisement. So, <laughs> how, many, how many of you have heard of the Be Informed Project? How many of you then, of those who've heard of it, how many of you have answered the win or loss survey online? In fact, I know that 70 people in New Jersey did answer the Be Informed Project. This is a very large project. It's a year and a half old now. What we're doing is basically doing an intensive survey of me, or part of it is doing an intensive winter loss survey and management survey. Now I know that your state APRIS does the same survey or a similar survey. I'll ask though that if you could next year please do both surveys. And I'll give you some of the results from this survey here this, this morning. And if the panel discussion uh, sort of peters out this afternoon, we'll give you some more results. But you can find all these results at the Be Informed website. So I hope the next time I come up to this meeting, that you all raise your hand and say that you participated in this survey. And so the next questions are, are based on this. Most beekeepers treat for varroa mites. Say 
No. Do you guys agree? You agree, but most beekeepers don't treat for rolling. In fact, the answer is no, most people don't. If you look at the, the survey response last year, or this was two years ago, two and a half thousand beekeepers. Last year it was 5,000 beekeepers, it was the same response. 61% of beekeepers did not treat for rolling. How many of you in this group do not treat for rolling? So most of you do treat for rolling. If you look at the answers, though, the people who do treat lose 20% more lose 20% fewer colonies than those who don't treat. So treating is the single most important factor that predicts whether your colonies are going to die or live the next year. And so I think it's an incredibly important part of a management system. This is U.S. This is U.S. I will say though that um, all commercial beekeepers. All beekeepers keeping 500 or more colonies, all of them treat for growth. There's not one commercial beekeeper in the country who would survive without treating. Now, I, I have to be honest, I was very surprised at this number. I was surprised at how many people aren't treating. And I think some of that is driven by the fact that we don't want to make our, our bees drug dependent because we don't want them to, you know, you know let's try to breed from surviving stock. However, I think that that idea that we can have three or four colonies in our backyard, not treat and breed from surviving stock, is a little naive. And it's a little naive on a couple fronts. One is you're not an island on your own. So unless you're sure that there's no one who keeps bees within five kilometers, or say three miles from your hive, when their colony starts collapsing, it's not like all those rollers say, oh, let's just stick around here and die. They're going to hitch a hike on those last bees and fly and invade your colony and you're going to die from that invasion of mites from your neighbor. Of course, you've also, in the fact that you haven't treated, guaranteed that the bee, that say you have one resistant colony and three susceptible colonies, well, those susceptible colonies are going to invade your resistant colony and overwhelm them. And you're going to do the same for all your neighbors. So it's not exactly very neighborly of you to let your colonies die from varroa mite resistance or because you, you've not treated. The other thing is, is that it probably isn't the bees that are resistant to varroa mite. It's rather that the varroa mites in, colon, in populations that are tolerant to varroa mite, it's probably not the bees that are resistant, it's more that the mites have become less virulent. And if you think about that, mites reproduce and have several generations in a year, where a bee colony may have one or two generations. And so if there's the pressure for a varroa mite, if it kills that colony, it will die too. But if it, if, if it can't go to a neighboring colony, but if, it, if it, it can live in harmony with the bees, then it's in its best interest to have as few kids as possible. And so I think it's noble, the idea of not treating. I just don't think it's practical. I don't think it's, it's a realistic expectation. I think we all do have to treat. So next question, you ready? Synthetic registered mite control products are the most effective approach to reducing varroa mite related products. So, so here, these are the registered products. Kumaphos, which is check mite, Kuvalinate, which is a mistake. False. Do you guys agree? In fact, that is true. If you look at mites, if the people who treated with Kuvalinate or Kumaphos, the people who treated with that product did not lose fewer or more colonies than those who did not treat with anything. However, the good news is that we have some biologically based products that work very effectively in the years. So we see Apigard, which is a thymol based product, which is an essential oil, and we have formic acid, which is now uh, is, is registered as an organic control product. And you can see both of these products work very well. And so it would seem that these products would be Good, good alternatives. So not always, and certainly there are populations of mitocide resistant mite. We think that kuma, that, that, um, is that some nitrocide? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, that's certainly, that's good old spell check. Yeah, no. All right, let's move on. Um, <laughs> Biologically based miticides, not matricides, are, are less harmful to bees than synthetic. You agree? 
Does your group agree? Yeah. You guys agree? Yeah. You disagree. So this is a study that was done in Hawaii. It's self-explanatory all the time. Right? <laughs> um, and so what we did was before there were mites in Hawaii, we decided to treat all these different colonies with mitocides. And what we can do then, and I didn't do this work, it was other people who did this work, the, 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 the molecular work, was that we can take those bees out before and after and look at what genes change, the expression of genes. And so each one of these, these columns is a different gene. And what you can see is that there's a star above Kumaphos, above and above Thymol. And wherever you see a star above that, that means there's been a significant shift in whether the gene has been expressed or has been downgraded. So if it goes blue, then it's, 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 it's being expressed. Red means that it's been closed down. And you can see that for thymol, which is apigard um, and all those things, uh, apigard and apolifar, that it shut down some of these genes that are used for detoxification, as did formic acid. And also we see some of these immune genes being suppressed, especially in the thymol treated columns. And so even though these are biologically based products, they can certainly still harm the column. Um, and I think the take home message is that you still don't want to just start dumping this product on the column, even if it is biologically based. You only want to use it when you need to. I do want to add something here that my thinking on when, or my recommendation about when you should treat has certainly changed. 10 years ago, five years ago, I would have said, make sure that you have mites before you treat. I think now that it's pretty clear that we only have certain windows in which we can treat our colonies. And so I would argue that what you want to do, and, and you want to do this right after your funny flow is over for the year, is you want to get a mitocide treatment in there. And then what you do is you come in afterwards, a month afterwards, and check to make sure that the mitocide treatment works. These biological-based products um, are a little bit tricky because they're temperature dependent a little bit. And so sometimes they don't work because of the temperature or because, say that you, it, with formic acid, if you had not sealed the colony properly, you won't get as an effective treatment. And so you want to come back. And the reason I'm saying a month later is that some of these treatments will hurt the mites but not necessarily kill them. So if you came a week later, you'd still find high levels of mites in your colony. It's only a month later that you're seeing those mites drop. So I think it should be standard practice that what you want to be doing is you want to be going um, into your colonies, treating them as soon as you can after the honey flow is done, and then after, after they've um, been treated a month later, make sure it works, and then maybe doing a mop-up treatment. Does that make sense? Yeah? There wasn't a lot of audience. <laughs> yeah? Dennis, no, th these guys. These guys are the winners here. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, you can either use the same product, or you can al alternate it up to another product. So, if you did paper guard for three weeks, you could try to do a formic acid, depending on the, the winter. Or you could do, if you just didn't get it down quite enough, you could do another treatment with the same product. It's a good idea to rotate these products out, though. You don't want to have the same product each time. Some people, this would be illegal to recommend or suggest. Some people would say that the mop up could be a half dose. It didn't have to be a full dose. That would be against the label instructions, so I couldn't recommend that you would do that. Yes. What about sugar shakes? I don't see that up there. It's just not work. You mean sugar shake as, as a monitoring method yeah. or as a treatment? As a treatment. Certainly, some people have said that they've got it to work. I don't know any of them. And I also don't know anyone who would want to do it more than once because it's just like, I mean, you leave the eye looking like a donut. I mean, it's just a really <laughs> messy, gross, I mean, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think, I think it does work. If you want it to work, you can make it work. I just don't know whether you want to spend your time cleaning powdered sugar out of your nose. So, um, I certainly would. So oxalic acid is, is a treatment. It's not registered for use in the United States. Um, 
And the reason for that is because to register it, to go through all the EPA process would cost about $150,000. And this is something you can buy at the hardware store for $2 or something like that. So there's no business that would register its use. It's a trickle method that only works if the colonies are broodless. I would be very surprised in New Jersey if you came across many colonies that were broodless for any period of time. And so I think that that's really the thing. It only works when it's broodless. You also have to be very careful. Basically what you do is you mix the oxalic with sugar syrup and, and you trickle it on and basically they eat it. And there's not really sure why it kills them. Some people are saying it makes the, the bees blood acidic and so the mites just die. Other people say it abrades the, the varroa. But the other problem is if you don't have acidic water, so if you have hard water or alkaline water, you have to make it acidic or it just precipitates out. So a lot of people try it and it doesn't work and that's because the water is too basic. Yeah. I don't think oxalic works unless you're the far north. I don't, I don't know that it's, it's a viable option for this area. Okay, what are the two most common bee viruses in the United States? Did you have an answer? No, I'm just like You guys agree or disagree? <laughs> That's a non-committal. Okay. So I've been part of the National Honeybee Disease Survey. This survey, so who has here had to participate in the National Honeybee Disease Survey? Where yeah, so we basically we put these kits together and we send them all around the country. You can see all the, 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 the states that participate in them. We get live bees that get sent to the USDA bee lab, where I, we have someone who works on this, the virus identification. We also have bees in alcohol, where my lab does the alcohol testing for the nosema and varroa. And then we also do this sort of slurry, where we look for some invasive mites that we don't have in the country. And so this year, three, 34 different states participated. 875 different sample kits got sent out, and I'm just about to have to motivate the team to make these kits, and they're all complaining about it because it's not enough. And about 7,000 different tests. And so from that, we get all these different answers, and in fact, for three years now, we can look at the viruses. DWV, by far the most prominent virus out there. Um, about 80% of all colonies have it. And the next colony is black queen cell virus. So black queen cell virus. And the question, of course, always is, well, does it matter? Do these viruses matter? Certainly DWV at very high levels can really mediate mortality or are a good predictor of mortality. But we don't know about black queen cell virus. We don't know what damage it does. We know if it's at very high levels in queen rearing operations, it will kill queen cells. But other than that, we don't know what it does. In fact, there's some evidence that before varroa mite came, that some of these viruses may have been beneficial. So for instance, there's a, a, a virus called the Kruger virus in Japan that's very similar to the deformable virus. And it turns out that if you have Kruger virus, you're much more likely to be a guard bee. So basically, it's in the colony's interest to have a couple crazy bees in the colony because they're going to be the guard bees. But of course, if the whole colony has Kruger bees, then you're really in a lot of trouble. And so some of these viruses may not be bad. So when you see these high levels, we're not sure that it's always a bad thing. The National Honeybee Disease Survey, we also look for tropolalapse mite. This is the tropolalapse mite here. This is a mite in Asia. To give you an idea of in Asia, where they keep um, the European honeybee as well, um, that was imported there. Varroa mite's always been there, of course, because that's where it exists. Beekeepers don't treat for varroa mite. They treat every two weeks to control tropolalapse mite because it reproduces like crazy. And so this represents one of the biggest threats we're facing in this country. In terms of that we don't have, we're really worried about getting this mite because it could cause a lot of problems. 
Um, I, I just think another really interesting trend here is we've been doing this for three years, and you can see that every year the number of mites that we have on average in colonies has gone up. It does seem like we're, we're increasingly having higher and higher mite loads, and that's a concern. At five mites per hundred, that's sort of the threshold, that if you have those mite levels of five mites or more in September, that colony is dead and doesn't know it yet. Because it's that, that, that level of infestation, if you're going into the winter, that you really start getting a lot of trouble. Often that has to do with not just that those mites are going to kill the bees, it means that that population of bees that are going to go into the winter have been parasitized. And that parasitism will shorten their lifespan by 30% or more. And so that's not so important in the summer, of course, because it just means you're going to lose honey production, because you're losing sort of end of life with their bees or foragers. But if you're expecting these bees to last several months, a 30% loss is quite dramatic. And that probably has to do with some of the losses that we've heard. Now, I will say that last winter we had the lowest rate of loss we've ever experienced, but that was probably because it was such a mild winter and bees were able to produce brood and replacement colonies for bees all year round. I will also say that in that National Honey Bee Disease Survey, we did test for pesticides. Most important was Cumaphos and Lovalinate, just under 40% in both. Also a lot of thymol, which of course is, well, all three of these are miticides. Cumaphos and Fluvalinate are very interesting because there are people who have not used Cumaphos or Fluvalinate for 10 years and also replaced every single frame in their colony and still have high levels of Cumaphos and Fluvalinate because it's able to transfer between colony. Um, the problem with Cumaphos and Fluvalinate as well is that we know it interferes with the bee's ability to detoxify other chemicals. And so if it's there, they're, they're, you know, they have these, these sort of, let's, let's imagine they're these machines. And they're coming in, they're like pails, and they're sort of bailing out the bees, toxic toxins in the bees. So these genes are working, bailing out these, these toxins. If you have another toxin coming, those pails are already full, working full blast. They're not able to get rid of that. And so we think that this may, this synergistic effect, may account for some of the increased susceptibility we have to some of the pesticides that are out there. Okay, we're now going to enter the lightning round. And so, in the lightning round, we're going to present a, a picture, and then you have to give a quick answer to what the picture is depicting. You ready? Let's get that harmonica ready. Are your fingers ready? And you can't come at all. You have two seconds to answer the question. You can't make it. All right, you ready? You find this in the spring. Should you be concerned? No. 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 Agree or disagree? You should be concerned. This is a mouse guard, and so the mouse guard was there, and as you cleaned it out, you found all sorts of dead bees. Well, you were right. You're still going to complain? <laughs> So, in fact, you always expect to find some dead bees. Stop complaining. <laughs> you always expect to find some dead bees at the bottom of your colony in the spring, especially after you've removed the mouse guard. And so, this is, this is pretty normal when you find some dead bees in your colony. You find that these are dead bees, a whole bunch of dead bees. I wonder if we should take some lights down. I haven't asked a question yet. <laughs> Did you get in a lot of trouble when you were in school? Um, so these are a lot of dead bees in the middle of the summer, a lot of dead bees in front of the colony. Should you be concerned? Yes. And what do you think caused it? Pesticide. Pesticide kill, right. So if you get a lot of dead bees, and this is the real problem we're facing now, is that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you had a pesticide kill, you knew it because you found a lot of dead bees in front of your colony. Now we have these new types of pesticides, these synthetic pesticides, that are very, very low levels that are getting into the bee. And what the idea is, you paint it on the seed so the farmer doesn't have to spray it, and it gets into the plant, and all plants produce a lot of toxins to fight against insects, but they've evolved so that it filters out those toxins so it's not in the pollen and nectar. But now you have this situation where these synthetic pesticides are getting into the nectar and pollen at very low doses. And so there's increasing evidence that these pesticides at very low doses 
by killing the colonies outright. It's not like you're going to see a bunch of dead bees at the bottom of the colony. It's making the bees much more susceptible to Nosema and to Varroa and other pathogens. So in a way, seeing dead bees like this in a very clear way is sort of reassuring because you know it's pesticide kill. A lot of that other stuff now is a little bit more difficult to diagnose. So, next slide. If you see these dead bees in front of the in the fall, should you be concerned? Are you blue? You got it. <laughs> yes, you should be concerned. You guys agree or disagree? Yes, they're all drones. Yes, no, so they're, they're drones. So, of course, in the fall, you do come across. I bet I bet some of this may have happened. When did this happen here? Did it happen last night, maybe? That certain, that first frost, where the, they are sort of kicking out the colonies. The drones are hanging outside, hoping to get in. Last night, they didn't let them in. And so that first frost, you'll see piles of dead drones in front. And that, of course, is just part of the natural fall cycle. You see this in the middle of winter. Should you be concerned? No. You agree. And that, of course, is because, and I actually, this is a really good point. I don't know that you'd see this very often here, because you probably don't have the severe winter that you might have otherwise. But um, when you have a lot of snow cover, and those bees are confined for a long time, they, they don't go to the bathroom in the hive, of course. And so what they do is they store their fecal matter. They can actually store a third to two thirds of their body weight in their intestinal tract. You can imagine they're real desperate to go by the time it gets warm. And so when it gets warm for the first time, they fly out of the colony and they poop. And this can be quite traumatic, especially if you pump sheets outside to dry. <laughs> also, you'll often find dead bees in the snow here. And that's because the, the bee has three eyes on the top of its head, the ocelli, and they're sort of acting like the bladder of a fish. And so what they're looking at is where the light is. So they know light is up, so that's how it flies. Well, if it's very sunny, that light is getting reflected off of the snow. So they turn upside down and dive bomb into the snow and die in the snow. So sometimes you'll see a lot of dead bees in that snow as well. Okay, you find a bee with this. Should you be concerned? No, you guys agree or disagree? It's, it's pollen. Yeah, so this is this is in fact pollen. There are some flowers, like uh, butter and eggs, um, that what happens is when the bee comes in, the pollen gets deposited on the back. And the bees, when they're flying, of course, will try to clean the pollen off their body. But they're not able to reach, oh sorry, they're not able to reach this part of their back. And so it becomes a skunk strike. When they enter the colony, bees will try to clean it off, but they don't do a good job. And so often you'll get bees that have this sort of yellow skunk line and racetrack line. And I get calls at least three times a year about someone who is sure they found a new bee disease called skunk disease because they have these yellow points. It also occurs with alfalfa or trefoil, and these plants have a trip mechanism. So when the bee lands on this part of the flower, it releases the, the anthers and bops the bee on the back of the head. And so what happens then is it has a thing. And this is why bees are really actually not very good at pollinating alfalfa. Because bees get knocked once or twice on the head. And they say, heck with that, I'm not doing this anymore. And what they'll do is they'll wait for other bees to, to cut holes in the flower and suck the nectar on the side or sort of get around that. Leaf cutter bees are stupid and they just keep going and getting knocked and knocked and knocked. And that's why they're much more effective pollinators than honeybees are for um, alfalfa. Okay, you find this colony, lots of eggs in the, in the brood. What is this? Laying worker. Laying worker. Sure. So work, laying workers, agree? So laying workers, pretty typical. What you see is the queen is the colony is hopelessly queenless. That means that there's no chance of making a new queen. The, the, the workers develop the ovaries and they start laying eggs. 
but of course these these worker bees never mate, and so they're unfertilized eggs, and they become drones, and that's why you see these big cappings in the worker comb. So a lot these colonies are essentially dead, and so if you wanted to to, to keep the bees that are there, what you have to do is you have to shake that colony about 30, 40 feet away from the colony, shake all the bees off, put it back in the original place, add some bees and brood, and start a new colony. Have the bees to do that? That's all the honey? Mm -hmm. He takes, he takes the bees for your Microphone, please. Microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Right behind you. There's a mic on the table. beekeeper in the state, all of you know, at one of our workshops talking about this says he takes a queen excluder and puts it on top of a queen right colony and then takes his queenless colony, his hopelessly queenless colony, and sticks the whole thing on top of the queen excluder. And what happens is the workers go up to the queen excluder, kill all of the laying workers, take them and dump them out front, and then the next day you can come and take your colony off and requeen it and have them accept the queen. Otherwise they will not accept the queen. But that strikes me as a lot easier than going up, you know, 50 feet away and dumping every sure. bee in the sure. rain out. Yeah, certainly that, that, that also works. I mean, it means that you have to come back the next day, but yeah, there's always those. Uh, lots of you just put uh, queen cells in. Right, and that, and that works for you? The problem with that, though, is with the queen cell, is that that queen still needs to mate. And see, these colonies are so digressed that you, you sort of are losing that. You really want to get brood in these colonies to get them going. That's what you're talking about. Mating is to go, go just make a queen in there. Right. But not in a, in a mating loop, that makes a lot of sense, I think. I think, though, if you want a productive colony a month or two later, you, I think you need to get a queen and brood in there because there's just nothing going in for a period of time. But, yeah. Okay, so now you come across this colony, and it has all these eggs in the bottom of cells. What's going on here? Okay, there isn't a young queen. So this colony has, oh, there's not a young queen. So that's a good point. Sometimes young queens will, will do this, but in this case, it's not a young queen. This is actually one of our other big concerns. Trochilelaps is one concern. The cape bee is the other concern. The cape bee is only found in the southern part of Africa. And what it does is it, its workers can actually lay fertilized eggs. And so that's why these are our worker cells here. And what happens here is this is a real concern because these colonies can parasitize other colonies. So if we were to ever get this condition, you would see that all our European colonies would get invaded by these Cape bee worker bees, take over the colonies and kill the colonies. And so this is something that we're asking people to watch out for, is if you find colonies that have a lot of laying workers, but you're not seeing them become drones, and it's not a young queen, that this is something we're alert for. We were hoping to find a molecular, a molecular test for this. So it turns out that these just come out as as purely Africanized bees, so you get alerted that they were Africanized bees, but they, they may be this cape bee. And so this is one of the things that we're working on. So this was a trick question, I didn't expect many people to answer. But um, the, the, this is one of the big concerns, I think, looming things that we have to try to prevent from coming into the country. Sure. So this slide, if you look, if you look at, at, at the cells, those are worker cells, but you can see they get this peanut shape. And that's because they're, yeah, they're drones, because they don't fit in the worker cell. Or in this one, you can see that it's just worker, worker cells. Well, I think that I, I think that as that drone, if you've ever seen a drone producing colony, you'll see that the, they start building up the wall to fit that drone. No, 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 no. no. 
I mean, also, you'll often find, you see on the side here, that's a good indication that it was a worker, not a queen. So that might be something to help you figure out the most. Yeah, well, or I don't know if they, can they tell at the end? I don't know. That's a good question. Right? Okay, this is the last question. This was a, a picture that was sent to me, and this is actually yellow, a big yellow squiggly. What is this? Wax moth tunnel. This is actually on the outside of the thing, so there's no webbing. And actually, we figured out that what this person did was they put their frame out in the sun, and it melted the wax, and it came out and, and became a squiggle. So that was it. So thank you for that. I hope you're around for the rest of the day. Uh, we'll have a, a question and answer period this afternoon. So if you have a lot of questions, we'll put it up. I will have a panel to address some of your questions. <laughs> this afternoon at the panel discussion. <laughs> uh, just to let everybody know, uh, Monica got three points. Thank you very much, guys. Rabbit Bell got eight and three quarters of points. So, congratulations.